Hey good people, and welcome back to the channel. It's Wednesday evening, and by now you already know what time it is. In a few moments, I'm going to get my thoughts and feelings on the foolishness known as Episode 7 of Married at First Sight Boston. And can I just be a little honest with all of you out there? I'm definitely already over this season. But I'm going to push through these reviews because I aim to give the people what they want. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. I think that it's only right for me to start the review off by discussing the Chris and Alyssa situation. As all of you already know, last episode Chris finally stood up for himself in front of everyone and told the group how he felt about his marriage to Alyssa. What kind of rubbed me the wrong way was how none of the cast members really had Chris's back, at least not in front of everyone where he could have used the support. After all, as bad as Alyssa has been through the process, Katina and Jasmina still supported Alyssa in her decision to not give Chris a direct answer while at dinner. And while I was proud of Lindsay for keeping a cool head at the dinner table, this situation would have been one that I could have given Lindsay a pass to act a fool with Alyssa. I mean, we fall down, but we get up, you know? So fast forward to this episode. As the episode begins, we see the couples moving into their respective apartments. When it comes time to show Chris and Alyssa, we see Chris moving into the apartment by himself. Later on in the episode, Chris meets with his friend Nick to talk about the situation with Alyssa. And Nick's response to Chris's marital problems is similar to how most men that I know would respond, with complete and utter disbelief. Alyssa's then shown meeting up with her mother to talk about her problems with Chris. Alyssa's mother feels that Chris is a good guy, but Alyssa spends most of the time essentially painting Chris as a comic book villain. She talks about how he was disrespectful to her, how he likes to argue his points, and how he has an Instagram post talking about how he wants to defund the police, which was in direct conflict with what she believed in. Alyssa's mother then asks Alyssa what would it take for her to stay married to Chris past decision day. And Alyssa gives her mother a load of BS with a cherry on top, while making her mother believe that Chris still has a chance to be with her. Now towards the end of the episode, Alyssa comes to the apartment to meet with Chris, and Pastor Kyle meets with them shortly thereafter. Pastor Kyle allows them to give their side of the story, which is a repeat of what we've already heard from the past several episodes. And as Alyssa continues to talk, Pastor Kyle's BS meter is going off like crazy, and he essentially calls her out for showing a pattern of not wanting to be around Chris. Alyssa then conjures up a story about her being allergic to big dogs like the one Chris has, but she's somehow not allergic to her own dog or the dogs that she works with. And all I can do is shake my head during this entire conversation. Further into the meeting, Alyssa is given an opportunity to address Chris and tell him what it will take for her to move forward. Chris replies to Alyssa by telling everyone there that this is his decision day and he is asking for a divorce. Alyssa then starts to cry again and claims how she worked so hard to get where she was. And I gotta be honest with you, Alyssa's demeanor during this entire scene lets me know that she's either mentally unstable or she's trying to get hired for an acting gig somewhere. But I was proud at how Chris handled himself during the scene and how he kept things classy when he could have gone down and dirty with Alyssa. I wish Chris nothing but the best, and while I don't wish anything bad to happen to Alyssa, I believe that she will go through much of her life regretting how she treated Chris. Now let's move on to Mark and Lindsay. We see them moving into their apartment, and the plan is for them to go to Mark's apartment to move his things out before the landlord has a fit. When Mark and Lindsay get to his apartment, they have to wear those white suits to prevent bed bugs from treating them like a midnight snack. Lindsay is trying to help Mark move out, but Mark is too afraid to tell Lindsay how he feels about her dumping things into a garbage bag and tossing them around. This causes conflict that snowballs into something bigger later on in the episode. We then see Mark touring Lindsay's apartment, and it turns out that Lindsay has several plants, all of which have names of their own. And during this tour, Lindsay feels that Mark is judging her apartment. But in her interview with production, she lets them know that she didn't judge Mark for having a dilapidated, bed bug infested apartment. And to that, I could honestly say that I wouldn't last five minutes being married to a woman like Lindsay, let alone dating. But later on in the episode, Lindsay and Mark have another argument because Lindsay feels that she is seeing two different sides of Mark. Lindsay then asks for some space, and when Pastor Cal arrives to talk to them, Mark is looking crazy while Lindsay is sitting on the patio by herself. When Lindsay comes back inside, she and Mark tell Pastor Cal about their marital problems. Mark breaks down and he doesn't feel like he's himself when he's around Lindsay, and Lindsay feels that Mark is completely pulled back from her. Pastor Cal lets both of them know, in a pretty blunt way, 
that they both have larger than life personalities and very few people would be able to deal with them. He encourages Lindsay to allow Mark to be himself while giving her doses of herself. Pastor Kyle also encourages Mark to affirm to Lindsay that he is committed to the process and he is willing to show it through his actions. I personally feel that Mark and Lindsay could be a good match if they follow Pastor Kyle's advice, but we all know that it doesn't take much for Lindsay to go off the rails. Next, we have Elijah Wan and Katina. They move into their apartment and Katina shares that she's never lived with a man before. Elijah Wan keeps hinting that he expects Katina to be in the kitchen and cooking on a regular basis. So here's how I feel about this. As a man, it would be a dream to meet a woman that can not only cook, but cook well and be willing to do so on a daily basis. It would definitely save a lot of money and create plenty of opportunities to have quality time. However, this is the real world. And in my opinion, a lot of women out there aren't trying to be in the kitchen on a daily basis. So while I think it would be nice to have a woman that cooks regularly, I understand that times have changed and I've even adapted to the times by learning how to cook for myself. So when Elijah Wan makes these statements about expecting Katina to cook every day, whether he's joking or not, he needs to realize that his expectations are not realistic. So later on in the episode, Katina goes to visit Elijah Wan's house. She describes it as a bachelor pad and claims that she would have to change things up if she were to live there. We barely get to see Elijah Wan spend any time at Katina's house before they're ready to meet up with Pastor Cal. When Pastor Cal comes to visit them, the topic of Elijah Wan expecting Katina to cook regularly comes up, and Pastor Cal tries to give Elijah Wan some words of wisdom on the topic, but I don't think Elijah Wan was listening. Katina shares that she feels Elijah Wan's execution when it comes to communication is pretty horrible. What I was surprised to learn was that Katina was open to consummating her marriage to Elijah Wan, but he was the one who pumped the brakes on it. Elijah Wan claims that in the back of his mind, he doesn't want to clap Katina's cheeks because he wonders what would happen if things didn't work out between the two of them. And to that, I call BS on that. You mean to tell me that Isaac had no problem tagging everything but third base and he likely slayed some mud ducks along in his journey, but Elijah Wan won't sleep with his own wife? Red flags, people. Red flags. I think the real reason is that Elijah Wan either doesn't find Katina physically attractive anymore or he just wants to be in control of her. But I was glad to see Pastor Cal challenge Elijah Wan's mindset when it came to this. Because it makes no sense how much Elijah Wan claims to adore his wife, but he won't be intimate with her. Now let's move on to Steve and Noi. As they move into their apartment together, much of their early scenes show the two of them in a very happy and flawless relationship. Later on in the episode, Steve goes to Noi's apartment, and Noi makes it known that Steve's relationship with her dog is very important. Why? Because Noi is one of those dog lovers that allows the dog to sleep in the same bed as her and get spoiled at every opportunity. Now I like dogs and all, but I surely won't be letting one sleep in my bed. But that's neither here nor there. I think Steve shares the same views on dogs that I do. Steve definitely isn't too keen on being assigned to poop duty when it comes to walking the dog, and I don't blame him. When Noi goes to visit Steve's place, we see a ton of gym equipment as well as LED lights. Steve has an addiction to LED lights, which made me scratch my head a few times during these scenes. Pastor Cal then goes to visit Steve and Noi, and they tell him that they hit the ground running in their marriage. The topic of having kids comes up, and Steve makes a very good point on being flexible when it comes to having kids. Noi then shares that she won't compromise when it comes to having three kids, which in my opinion is a huge red flag. Pastor Cal raises some interesting points about the possibility of not being able to have kids, and it gives Noi some food for thought. The topic of finances comes up, and Noi shares that it's scary for her because she doesn't want to have to worry about money. And with Noi as well as her family being refugees with very little resources, I see why she feels that way. Steve assures Noi that he will always be in a position to make money, but he ultimately wants to get back into his career. Pastor Cal then gives Steve some insight that Noi ultimately wants to know that her husband can provide for her and her family. And last but not least, let's talk about this Michael and Jasmina situation. When they come back from their honeymoon, they are shown moving into their apartment, or so we thought. It turns out that Michael is moving into the apartment by himself, while Jasmine is opting to stay at her place for a few days. When asked why she plans to stay away, Jasmine replies that she needs to get some things squared away for her dog. And in the back of my mind, I'm asking myself why can't that be taken care of at the new apartment? Michael then voices his concerns about Jasmine living apart from him 
especially after an argument because married people should be in a position where they work things out. Jasmina replies by assuring Michael that she's just going to her place to figure things out for her dog. And in my opinion, Jasmina is clearly lying. I believe that people make time for those that they want to make time for. And Jasmina using her dog as an excuse to stay away from Michael was about as lame as Zach from the Houston season staying at his place when Michaela thought he was going to spend the night with her that one night. I want to reiterate that I think that Jasmina shares some of the same qualities that Alyssa has in that when she has an issue with someone, she will be somewhat passive aggressive about it until the time comes where she's backed into a corner. But later on in the episode, Jasmina admits that she lied to Michael because she needed to reset and come into the marriage with a clear head. So later on in the episode, Jasmina visits Michael's place and she describes his room as a frat boy room. The discussion of Michael's roommate comes up and Jasmina learns that Michael has a female roommate. And in the interest of fairness, earlier in the episode, Jasmina revealed that she had a guy roommate and asked Michael point blank if he ever lived with a woman and Michael replied that he had never lived with a woman. So that makes him a liar too. Michael claims that he didn't purposely hide the information from Jasmina and to me, that excuse was kind of weak. How do you not know or remember having a female roommate when asked about your roommate situation? Jasmina claims to be annoyed that Michael didn't tell her about his female roommate, but I think Michael intentionally hid it from her because he felt that she would overreact upon learning about it. That doesn't make it right, but it shows that these two really don't trust one another. They both clearly have issues that they need to seek professional help for. As Jasmine is finally moving into the apartment, she picks this time to spark a brand new conflict with Michael. This conflict centers around Michael having two female roommates and never mentioning anything about them to her. Now I would fully back Jasmina's right to be angry with Michael about deceiving her if she didn't deceive him earlier about wanting to spend time away from him. You see, during this time in their journey, it's my opinion that Jasmina has already made her mind up that Michael isn't the guy for her, but she's looking for any shred of evidence to justify her decision to get a divorce while not tarnishing her public image the same way that Alyssa did. Pastor Cal then comes to visit Michael and Jasmina, they have a sit down and he asks them point blank, how's their marriage going? And they're both silent. So he encourages them to be open and honest about it. Jasmina claims that Michael was disrespectful, loud and aggressive with her, and she feels that he has the potential to explode. Michael tries to defend himself by saying that Jasmina is using his acknowledgement of his issues to paint a picture of him, and that is when the conversation goes south. Jasmina accuses Michael of acting a different way when the cameras are off. Pastor Gal regains control of the conversation and asks them why their communication isn't working. Pastor Cal asks Jasmina if she's willing to forgive and move on, and she reluctantly says yes. Pastor Cal encourages Jasmina to remind Michael that when she feels that he's talking to her in a way that she doesn't like, that she reminds Michael that she is not the enemy. But sadly, I think the issues that Michael and Jasmina have are well beyond the show. I think they are deep-seated and their marriage absolutely has no shot of surviving past decision day. As I said last week, Jasmina and Michael are oil and water. They have no business being together and they'll eventually end up like Zach and Michaela from last season. But overall, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'll give this episode a 5. The episode was draining and while I respected Chris for finally pulling the plug on his marriage, I see three other marriages that have absolutely no shot of making it through the long haul. But this marks the end of my review. Please leave any comments or questions below in the comment section, and I'll be sure to reply to each and every one of them. Until next time, stay tuned and stay safe. Peace.